My name is Renee Hlajek. I am an assistant professor at the Dunlap Institute and the Department for Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. Hi, Professor Lazik. My name is Helen. It's a great honor to have you as our senior scientist guest for I Am A Scientist series. So to start off, I know you mentioned that you're from the Department of Astrophysics. So what is astrophysics? Astrophysics is the most amazing job. I think it's the most amazing thing to study. Um, basically what it means is we look at the sky, we look at the things in it, so stars, planets, the sun, light from the Big Bang, and we ask ourselves not just what it looks like, but what are the physical principles and theories and observations that help us understand? So we really want to figure out how the universe works and we use that by making measurements of the, um, astronomy, the astronomy world, basically. So could you give us some examples? What are some of uh, the astrophysics' biggest achievements so far? Sure. So my particular brand of astrophysics or my particular field of astrophysics is cosmology. And so cosmology is really asking where did the universe come from? What is the universe made of? How is the universe changing with time? And some uh, amazing achievements that we have in cosmology and astrophysics more generally is, you know, we have made measurements of the very cold radiation that comes from a time in the universe that's about 400,000 years after the first moment. So this is light that's coming from just after the Big Bang. It travels to our detectors and we measure it on Earth today. Um, and we use incredible telescopes to, to measure this radiation. We've also detected um, signals from the merging of two uh, black holes that send these tiny ripples through the, the actual space time and we can measure that with telescopes today so a lot of our um, observations and detections are really transformative because they are measuring something cool that happens but also linking it to a theory and a physical understanding of how the universe works wow thank you so much that's very fascinating um so to bring it to more perspective that with our audience how has our better understanding of the universe change our daily lives? It's a really interesting question. How does astrophysics change our lives? And there are a few different things we can answer. Um, on one hand, a lot of the technology that we use, like uh, GPS and uh, uh, understanding of um, mapping the universe, a lot of that comes from developments related to astronomy and technologies related to astronomy. Similarly, a lot of the technologies that were developed to put people on the moon actually can be of use um, on Earth. But to me, the reason why astro astrophysics and astronomy in general is so transformative is not so much because it changes tangibly things in my life, like my cell phone or my car, but it really gives us an understanding of the world that is bigger than ourselves. And so it encourages us to think more broadly, to be expansive, and to imagine the world as more important than just our own issues. And that's, for me, the biggest gift because it takes you out of yourself and allows you to ask the really fundamental questions. Thank you so much. And I'm sure that um, none of us, especially me, cannot live without Google Maps. So <laughs> um, astrophysics really helps our daily life and they really um, give us a different perspective from just studying biology. Um, so now it comes to another question I really have for you is how did you first become interested in science? I am really lucky that I was always encouraged to be curious. So my family always said to me, you know, you should think about things as much as you are interested. And in fact, I was given a set of books, um, like a, a children's set of books about the world. And actually it wasn't astronomy that was the first thing that I read, but I read about why leaves change color. Now I'm from South Africa. So in general, we don't have leaves that change color and fall off the trees. Um, and in North America, you do. And so this book was based in North America and I saw pictures of the physics and the biology and the chemistry of why leaves change color. And to me, this, it just blew me away because this thing I thought was beautiful, I could actually explain 
with with physics and with uh, with biology and that to me was amazing and it really made me start thinking about you know when you put your feet in lake ontario and you see the ripples in the um in the water and then you see light patterns on the ground and you know that those are connected all of those small observations where i look at something in the natural world and i explain it with physics or the principles of light or, or motion that to me was so powerful and really made me want to do this for the rest of my life it's very fascinating to see that you got your interest um passion for science from a book and i know a lot of science that's the one we're studying here too in biology. It's really study the nature, which is very fascinating. And we're just trying to explain and try to find uh, the logic behind nature. Um, so you mentioned that you're from South Africa and I see that you did your undergrad in University of Pretoria and then you moved to Oxford University to get your PhD. And you also went to um, Princeton University for your postdoc and now you're assistant professor at University of Toronto. So this is a very fascinating journey. You move around from two different countries and different cultures. So through your journey, did you face any hardship or barriers on your path? Yeah, I've had, I have been really lucky to have the ability to move around the world. And I think um, as a scientist, it's easy to take for granted. It's an international field and I'm really lucky that I could move around. Um, and it hasn't always been easy. It's, it's hard living away from your family um, and to know that you will do that basically for your whole life um, as an adult. That part is difficult. You move, you miss out on birthdays and celebrations. Um, you know, there are also things that happen in science. Um, it's not always easy. Sometimes you have profs that, you know, don't treat you well. I've had some sexual harassment things that have happened. Those things aren't I don't mind talking about them. They're not great um, things in science. Um, and those can often make you despondent. But I have been really lucky that throughout my life, my um, uh, high school teachers, my parents always encouraged me to be as much of a scientist as I wanted to. And I was never, in that sense, I had a big support in my life. But I think that's not always the case. Sometimes people are told, you, you you can't be a scientist, you shouldn't think of doing this, you should plan for something else. And so I'm lucky that I had people to support me. And it's sad being far away from my family, especially now um, in this time, but I'm, I've been really lucky. Yeah, it's wonderful to have you um, as our guest speaker too, because um, the theme for our science rendezvous is really to um, advocate and really want to promote diversity in science and seeing a female representative, especially a physicist, is um, very encouraging and inspiring for everyone. So, and that brings us to another topic that um, I think a lot the public have a, some stereotype for physicists in general, and that could come from social media. And one show that I, I personally watch and really like is The Big Bang Theory. Um, so in social media and like in the Big Bang Theory, they portray physicists or astrophysicists with some stereotypes. Some can be positive and some can be negative. So what do you think about these representations of physicists and scientists? Yeah, this is something that's very important to me. I, I, I look, I fully understand. TV shows like the Big Bang Theory, they have to be funny. And so often, what people do is they make a very extreme caricature. They sort of make a cartoon of scientists and other people to try and make, make us laugh. Um, my, the issue is that, um, you know, I have been told many times uh, in my journey that if I want to be a scientist, I shouldn't um, change my hair. I shouldn't wear makeup. I need to be serious. I can't make jokes. I can't have hobbies. Um, and, this really hurt me when I was a student because I thought there was something wrong with me, like I wasn't a scientist enough. And then I realized that the thing that makes you a scientist is doing science. And so I am a scientist because I do science and I ask these questions. And so I think if stereotypes start to become um, a barrier to people, if they look at the stereotypes and they look at the scientific field and they think, all of these people look the same and all of these people act in a certain way. I can't be a scientist. That's when it becomes a problem. And so mm -hmm. I really work quite hard to tell students like you can have a tattoo and be a scientist. You can have, you know, any uh, uh, 
characteristic that people stereotypically don't associate with scientists. The thing that I care about is the ideas in your head and the way you care about the world. And that's what's the most important thing to me. I absolutely agree. And I think all the amazing scientists out there is really about their knowledge and their passion and their curiosity. And it's not about um, who they who they are and what they yeah, do. And, and I feel a little bit like maybe maybe it's because we are lazy in the world when we describe people and we don't want to give every scientist the complexity that they deserve. And so we just say, oh, they wear a lab coat. You know, like I, I often tell people, I don't wear lab coats. I'm not a biologist. I don't work with chemicals. I'm not a chemist. So I don't wear a lab coat. And if someone says to me, will you please put on a lab coat for this photo shoot? I say, no, that's not what I do. You know, and I think sometimes we just get, we use simplifications rather than being a little bit more thoughtful in our representations of people. Absolutely, I really agree with you. And that's what we really want to push here at Science Rendezvous and I am a scientist. And with our vlog for graduate students, um, we wa really want to show what daily life is about and the reality part of all scientists, you know, the boring part and the fun part. Um, so I, I really love your idea about what is a scientist and you seem to be very active on social media too to promote this. And I watched many of your TikTok videos, they're amazing. <laughs> um, so you're a TikTok, you, sorry, you're, you're a TED senior fellow. So mm -hmm. as a scientist, what makes you engage with the public? Why, why are you doing all this? There are a couple of different reasons why I love engaging with the public as a scientist. The first is I just love it when you see someone get excited by the stuff that makes me excited. So it's kind of selfish because I love talking about the things I, I work on. Um, I also think it's a real privilege to do my job. I, I'm at a publicly funded university and I am answering these questions partly because I'm so curious, but that's a huge privilege. And I feel like it's my duty to convey what I'm learning to the public and also to get people excited so that one day there can be more scientists doing these kinds of things. Um, and, and so I feel like it's a duty. And the final thing is that I went to talks by scientists as a kid. I watched interviews and I thought to myself, you know, wow, imagine if that could be my life. And so partly I just want to pay back um, so that somewhere there's someone who sees me and goes, maybe, okay, I can be a scientist too because it had a huge impact on me to see people being curious for a living. And, and I want to give that to someone else. Yes, and it's truly a privilege. I agree the, the same concept you have is that being a scientist, you can always ask questions and you can make a living out of something that you really like and always pushing the boundary in science. I think that's something we're all passionate about being a scientist. Um, so before we end our interview, do you have any advice for kids who may be interested in STEM? My advice to kids would be um, just because you like STEM, it doesn't have to be easy. A lot of the time people say, oh, I could never be a scientist because I'm bad at math or I'm bad at physics. And that language where you tell yourself what you can and cannot do based on how good you are can actually really hold you back. Like I am not the best mathematician. I work really hard and I think, and I love what I do, but it's not easy for me. And sometimes I think we think it's gonna be easy. And so that holds us back. You know, my favorite thing about science is that it's really, really hard. It's like building a really, really big puzzle. Most of the time I'm looking at the puzzle and all the pieces are blue and I can't make the puzzle pieces match, but it's that slow work that really brings you the, the joy and the, and the fulfillment at the end. And so my advice to young people interested in STEM is, it's okay if it's hard sometimes. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means it's a really fun challenge. And if you keep that mindset, then it'll become fun as well. Yeah, and after you solve the problem, you've been having headache for a long time, the accomplishment you feel is like, you never feel that much happiness before. You're a hero, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much for being our guest speaker again.